What's going on everybody? It's Joe from God's Eye Games slash The Acceptable Casualties and we're here to take a, a look at Steel and Steed. I'm going to do a little page by page preview of the entire book right here. So uh, those of you who are interested in doing some Knights of Tournament, uh, I'll be able to kind of see where your dollar is going to be going if you guys decide to pick up the book. It's going to be kind of along the same lines as what I did for Sons of Mars uh, last year <clears throat> before we released the book. So like I said, we're going to go through every page of the book, kind of show you guys what the content is. Um, you know what the book has to offer from start to finish and you know see what you guys can be able to do uh, with our Knights of Tournament rule set so this is right here just the title page uh, right off the bat you know uh, nothing you know big here it's kind of just like the credit roll to let you guys know uh, down here you know everybody who worked on the game and, and all the stuff that uh, kind of went into it like who did what and, and who contributed where uh, right here is our table of contents so as you guys can see it's roughly going to be about 110 to 115 pages you know this isn't the um, exact finished product which is going to go to print you guys are going to see that as we go through here there might be a couple things that get like changed or maybe some things that get added we haven't put all the pictures in yet either so uh, you guys are going to see some blank spots with um with some like pink text in there so that's where it's like some other pictures are going to go so this is still in production but it's pretty much done so what you see is what you're going to get probably 95 percent of the time there's going to be some minor tweaks going forward but uh, here's a table of contents right here this is kind of a rough idea of um how the book's going to be laid out like i said it's going to be between 110 and 115 pages um, from start to finish. So that's what we're looking at right here. Uh, getting into page four, we've got our, what's needed to play, so you guys will know you know, how much, <clears throat> how many dice you're gonna need to bring, what kind of dice, all the stuff that you're gonna need to play as far as table size and everything else that goes with it. Uh, we also have rules in here for setting up a tournament. So uh, the basis of the game is gonna be built around um, you know, medieval tournament Knights of Tournament competition. So you're going to have uh, rules for different types of one-on-one -on -one combat competitions. We're going to have jousting in there, mounted combat, uh, team combat on foot. It's like Grand Melee is what it's called. Um, also, team combat on horseback. We have uh, rules for archery. So all these different things you're going to be able to put into tournament settings and uh, create your own competitions. Or if you decide to play in a campaign, uh, those competitions are going to kind of be laid out for you in a narrative sense over the course of a calendar year. And then that calendar year can kind of roll over into multiple years and you can kind of play it as long as you want. There's uh, rules in here for scoring as well for the... Uh, for you know, how you place inside these tournaments and these competitions. So if you're playing competitively, uh, you can keep track of scores and, and see who comes out at the end and wins. Uh, over here we have just kind of like the tournament bracket set up. Uh, for those of you, most of these competitions are going to be eight nights uh, competing in each one of these competitions. So this kind of explains how you want to lay it out, how that progresses going forward. Uh, it also explains how if you want to add NPC knights to your tournament, if you don't have enough players, maybe fill out the eight-man bracket. Or if you have an odd number of guys instead of an even number of guys, uh, we have 30 NPCs that are completely fleshed out at the back of the book, and we'll get to those later. And you can add those into your tournaments and use them for campaign play. Um, next up, it just kind of let the games begin. This is how we go over... Pretty much the uh, the basic rules for the book, um, for, for combat, for everything that you're going to be needing when you're playing Steel and Steed. So this goes over uh, initiative tests, uh, as you can see down here, attribute tests, kind of like the basic stuff you need for gameplay to get started. Uh, over here um, is the action section. This is going to be on page 8 and 9. Uh, this runs very similarly to those of you who've played Sons of Mars. It, it uses the same um, action pool that you use for, for Sons of Mars as well, where you're going to get two actions per turn, and then you're going to be able to pick from this series of actions right here to see what you want to do with your knight. And this is for this is for combat. There's uh, separate things they're going to use for jousting and archery as well. So what we're looking at right now is, is pretty much the core rules for combat on foot as well as mounted combat. So these are the actions you're going to be able to choose from. Most of these are the same as Sons of Mars. There's some minor tweaks in there to kind of really... Um, make it mesh better with Knights of Tournament combat, but for the most part, you're going to be using roughly the same types of actions uh, that you use for Sons of Mars that you will use for Steel and Steed. Uh, next up we have right here is a continuation on uh, page 10 of some of the extra actions right here, and then it goes into movement. Um, we added some different things to the to the movement and to the combat system, like minor changes. Uh, you have to read through and kind of see the differences here. But you know, if you get hit with a critical hit, uh, you're forced to move um, back an inch. It kind of creates a little bit more uh, a little more movement, a little more fluidity on the on the battlefield when you're playing, opposed to just standing toe to toe and playing whack a mole. We decided to add some things that that um, 
promote promote you moving around the arena trying to uh, to get into better positions instead of like I said just standing toe to toe and, and rolling dice at each other which is what we want to avoid at all costs because that gets boring so we tried to add and improve on the combat system in certain little areas to uh, to really kind of uh, reinforce that idea so that's the movement section right here we have melee and mounted combat uh, section right here you know how you're gonna resolve your combats you know basic stuff that you guys see in, in every game armor saves uh, critical successes and how they work we did bring death blows back for the Knights of tournament um, you know medieval tournament it, it wasn't really about like you know you killing somebody it's one kind of just you besting them and, and showing them up with your skill so death blows don't play as major of a, of a role in campaign play or even just regular tournament play uh, if you're playing with guys down at the gaming club or, or with your friends uh, it's a rare occasion thing but it, it was a risk in 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 tournaments with these knights even though like you know they were just covered in armor the weapons for the most part were blunted um, you know things still do happen so we wanted to kind of represent that so we did bring the death blow rule over from Sons of Mars and put it in here uh, and it works relatively the same way as that so this is what you have right here crystal successes death blows next page we did bring back the fatigue system so that's uh, that's still in play as well uh, now you have a choice between primary and mounted weapons so if you're on foot you're gonna be able to use uh, certain types of primary weapons if you're mounted on horse you're going to have um, your mounted weapons to choose from but obviously some weapons mounted on horseback um, aren't going to work like if you're using like you know a halberd or, or you know some large two-handed weapons you won't be able to use them mounted you won't be able to use them primarily on foot so that kind of goes through and explains uh, how that's gonna work uh, when you're in combat, where you have to call your squire to bring over different weapons based on the situation that you're in. Uh, we also have rules for multiple knights in combat when you're fighting in grand melee. This will be when it comes into play most because um, most other situations, whether it's jousting or you know one-on-one -on -one combat on foot, you're going to be doing just one-on-one. -on -one. But multiple knights in grand melee setting, when you have these large teams fighting each other, uh, trying to grab each other, uh, for ransoms and things like that you're gonna have situations where you're gonna have two on ones so this is um or three on one or four on one or whatever it's gonna end up being uh these are the rules for multiple knights in combat uh there's also rules here for mounted combat like i said for and we're gonna be referencing sons of mars a lot because the core mechanics for both of these games are going to be very similar but there's also going to be a lot of adjustments made to kind of really capture the medieval knights of tournament feel so uh, mounted combat has a lot of the same principles as sons of mars uh, but we also added um, some different things in there to kind of grab that medieval feel so you know this is the mounted combat section right here uh, as well as obstacles down here as well so um <clears throat> for medieval tournaments usually when you're fighting in in the one-on-one -on -one combat or uh, mounted combat we wanted to set it up to where you have a certain area, you know, inches wise, you know, it could be anywhere between 12 to 20 inches that you're going to be fighting. We left it up to you, the players, where if you wanted to add in a perimeter wall around there where um, you can push your opponent into it and possibly knock them to the ground, or you can leave that wall completely open and and not have that and just kind of have it as an open field so we left that in there for you guys to kind of choose so there's not a lot of obstacles when you look at knights of tournament compared to gladiator combat so really the only thing you're gonna be worrying about right now is going to be the perimeter wall for obstacles for combat and that's something that we wanted to leave up to the players uh to choose if they wanted to add that in there or just kind of leave it open and not have to really deal with getting pushed into any kind of obstacle like a fence or anything like that. We suggest using it because it adds another strategic uh, element to the game, but it's it's one of those optional bolt-on rules where if you want to use it, you can. Uh, going further down to page 16, so this is going to be a uh, favor dice. So for favor dice, uh, it's like I said, it works very similar. This is if you end up rolling a, a 10 on your dice pool and the guy fails a save against it, you're going to get a favor die for that. You're also going to get a favor die for playing to the crowd, intimidating your opponent. Um, for jousting, if you uh, end up breaking your lance uh, with like a really clean hit, you get a favor die for that. If you knock an opponent from their mount while jousting, you get a point for that. For archery, if you score a bullseye or split an opponent's arrow, you get a favor die for that. So there's different ways for you to get favor dies. There's also different ways for you to use them as well, and that's kind of all covered in the favor die section right here. Uh, this page over here, obviously, you know, we're we got a spot set up here for a full page photo so this is what i was talking about uh previously so if you see any sections like this this is where you're gonna see photos or maybe some different graphs or, or things like that they're gonna get thrown into these empty spots uh going on to page 18 right here we're going to go into like types of matches that we're going to have so each page is going to have um a basic rundown of what we're looking at right here so over on this page we have one-on-one -on -one combat on foot and this kind of goes over the rules for one-on-one -on -one combat on foot like um 
how many rounds you're going to be fighting, what are the terms for victory, uh, setting up the match. Uh, so you're looking down here, we added in little graphs so you can kind of see uh, this is set up for a 12 by 12 square boundary and then in the middle it shows the spacing between you and your opponent. Very simple to kind of set this stuff up for one-on-one -on -one combat rules. Like I said, the fencing on the outside is completely optional based off the obstacles rule that, um, that's going to be decided by you and the, and the people that you're playing with. So this is one-on-one -on -one combat on foot. Next page we have Grand Melee. This is team combat. So this one can be two on two up to four on four. Uh, for this right here, um, this is where you have, it's not just about beating your opponent, but also if you're able to defeat your opponent and then you can drag them back to your scoring zones over here, you're able to get points and you're able to hold your opponent for ransom. And for uh, campaign play, that plays a big deal because if you get an opponent and you hold them for ransom, for them to get back into the campaign, they either have to pay you a certain amount of gold or they pay you in prestige, which we'll get into later, kind of like a way of them bending the knee and, and asking for their equipment back, which, you know, is, is a grand smack in the face, especially when, like, honor is a currency. So um, that's kind of how that works in there. And this goes over, once again, how to set up and, and play a grand melee between two uh, opposing houses or maybe just a, a mix of different types of knights that are just going together to, to fight in a grand melee. Uh, so what else we got here? Page 22 we're coming up on. This is team combat on foot. This is for two-on-two -two combat up to four-on-four -four combat without the grand melee rules. So that's what you have team combat on foot over here. Uh, over on this side, on the right, we have one-on-one -on -one mounted combat rules as well. This opens up to a 20-by-20 20 20, um, boundary. Uh, uses mounted combat. Obviously, if you get knocked from your mount, you still can't fight on foot against a mounted opponent, but the, the battlefield's opened up more because the horses that you're going to be able to use, obviously you're going to get more movement with it, and it, it promotes kind of riding through these combats, riding through your opponents, circling back and fighting again. So we wanted to open up the boundaries a little bit more to allow for uh, the players to kind of really get that feel instead of kind of being boxed in on horseback and fighting in a phone booth, which is what we don't want in that situation. Uh, so down here, we're going into page 24. <clears throat> This is just basic mounted melee um, that we're looking at. So this is kind of just like the grand melee on foot, except this is going to be two on two up to four on four, uh, you know, and you defeating your opponent on horseback, trying to drag them back to the point zone so you can get points for it and hold them for ransom in campaign play. Uh, it gives over all the rules for that. And this also plays in a, uh, in a 20 by 20 uh, battleground as well. So we kind of kept that open as well for the grand melee. Uh, what else we got here? Next page. Let me scroll down here. Um, we're looking at 26. This gets into the jousting rules. So on page 26, uh, jousting was the big thing that I, I really wanted to try to get right when uh, we put this rule set together. So I tried to keep this... Um, I don't say simple is not the right word, but it is engaging as possible, but also leave a lot of strategic elements in there. So the players can be able to kind of dive in, get a real chance quickly to kind of dive into the rules and get comfortable with them and then add depth based on a lot of strategic decisions that you're going to be able to make as you play. So this goes over the uh, jousting rules and how we score. There's going to be like roughly five passes. So passes, you and your opponent running at each other, trying to hit each other with their lance and either score points or dismount your opponent. So you're going to have five passes to go at each other with and based on you know how you hit your opponent, whether you dismount them, whether you break a lance as you hit them, you're going to get a certain amount of points for that. And at the end of those five passes, whoever has the highest amount of points is going to be deemed the victor. You also can... Um, dismount your opponent, like say you hit him with a, a really strong shot and you're able to knock him from his horse. If he's not able to get back up and remount his horse, that's the end of the match right there and you win. So there's different ways to win, whether it's scoring, knocking your opponent from their mount and they're not able to get back up. Uh, so this adds different layers of strategy going into it. This is the tilt yard up here on the right hand side. This kind of shows it's going to be a 40 inch tilt yard. So if you have a three, um, a three by three area to play in, you just run this tilt yard uh, diagonally, whether you have one built or you just want to use like a, a string or a series of markers on, on um, your playing surface, however you want to do to represent that, uh, you're going to need roughly 40 inches to um, to set up the tilt yard so you can do jousting. So this kind of just goes over how that's all set up right there. Uh, next page, it goes over initiative and movement. Um, so that's obviously that, that is what it is. Uh, impact is going to be kind of like, uh, when you and your opponent meet each other, who ends up winning the combat and, and who's able to hit the other person. And there's also, um, techniques that you're able to choose from. So we want to kind of make this as strategic as possible. So when you're running your opponent, 
and you get into that point where you're going to be impacting each other, you have to make a choice on how you want to hit your opponent. You want to use just a standard technique where it doesn't add any modifiers to your knight's um, dice pools or you know their plus minuses uh, for anything. You would use a standard technique. We also have an accurate technique where um, you might be able to get an extra die for the combat, but when it comes to dismounting your combat, uh, dismounting your opponent, if you get a good hit on them, it's going to be harder to do because you're focused more on the accuracy of your shot to score points opposed to the strength of your shot to knock him off his mount. And then the last one would be called thrust technique. This one is where you're losing dice to your dice pool, but you're adding strength to your knight. So if you do end up winning the combat and landing that strike, uh, there's a better opportunity for you to dismount your opponent. You can score more points doing that. It's very hard to do, but you can score more points doing that, and you can also end the jousting competition if they're they're unable to get back up. So these techniques are kind of ways for you to, um, you know, go throughout the flow of, of a jousting competition. And if you need to just try to keep a point, uh, keep ahead on points, you might want to go with the accuracy technique. If you just want to kind of be a jack of all trades, you might stick with the standard technique in certain situations. Maybe you're getting your butt kicked and you're like, man, this is like my last shot, fifth pass. I got to do something here. You, you're almost in a situation where like, okay, I got to do the thrust technique. It's like all or nothing here. They're got to dismount this guy and, and knock him out of the competition or, or I just lose. So we wanted to add these in there. So we give the player, the opportunity to do something just besides rolling dice, actually give them some choices and some decisions to make over the course of the entire uh, contest. So that's how that works. Um, we have uh, critical successes in Joust, and this is where you would break your lance if you hit somebody with a critical success. You get um, an extra point for doing that for scoring as well as favor dice. Uh, there's some little rules that go with that as well. Stability test. Uh, if you end up, you know, losing the impact, which is, you know, the, the combat for jousting, you have to make a stability test. And if you pass that, you stay on your horse and you just continue to pass by. You know, obviously, you you would um, your opponent would still get points for it. But if you fail your stability test, that's when you get knocked from your house and uh, knocked from your horse. And there's a series of uh, dice rolls and things you have to do to see if you get uh, back on your mount to continue the competition. And like below this, this is the rules for being knocked from your mount. So that's kind of the the general lay of the land for jousting and how it works like so we wanted to really open this up and um and make it about strategic choices and as we get further you're going to see you're going to have options for different horses different types of lances there's going to be lots of layers to creating your knight and how it's going to affect the gameplay going forward uh this is the last part of jousting so we do have a jousting injury table here so <clears throat> you know jousting was extremely dangerous um you know for reasons I really don't need to explain here. I mean, you have two guys, you know, weighing hundreds of pounds with all this armor on them, riding each other full force, you know, hitting each other with a long stick and then knocking each other off uh, these horses. There's just, there's tons of opportunity for injuries and things to go wrong. So we wanted to put that into the game. So in here, um, some of these injuries that you're going to have in here are going to be, you know, simple as maybe you taking penalties just for the remainder of the competition or, you know, you know, if you're jousting in your first contest and then you have, uh, you know, foot combat for the second contest of the tournament and going forward, some of these injuries might carry over. Um, and you'll have penalties throughout the entire tournament. So that's what some of these injuries are. Some of them are more geared toward uh, campaign play that you might run into where, you know, you might get concussed and you're unable to compete in the rest of the tournament. Like you're, you're just out of it. You can't do anything. There's other things in here like broken hips, shattered collarbones. So you'll permanently lose stats to your, to your knight uh, off here. There's also a thing where your lance shatters, your opponent's lance shatters, and part of the lance goes into your horse and kills your horse. So you have to purchase a new horse and start from scratch as far as leveling your horse up. And then also, if you get hit with a bad enough um, shot and you end up rolling along the injury table, you awkwardly fall from your horse and you fall to your death. And that's the end of your night. So you have to start and create a new one or just use a different knight from your knightly house. So that's the jousting injury table kind of in a nutshell. Like, and if you guys pick up the book, you'll be able to kind of read through it and see what it is. But this is what we're looking at for jousting. So that's everything we have uh, in the book right now for jousting. Uh, we're on page 31 right now. So going on to page 32, these are the rules for archery. Excuse me, I'm just gonna grab a drink of water here. So um, so for archery, what we're looking at for archery right now, um, it's not your traditional wargaming. It's kind of hard to, to do archery contest. Uh, you know what I mean? You have a static target or a static series of targets, and then you have your static archers. There's not a lot of movement or anything. like It's not very good for you know your traditional wargaming, but I still wanted to put it in there because I know a lot of people enjoy that... Um, Arch competition or you know that Robin Hood themed tournament. So I, I felt like I had to go in there. So 
what I ended up putting together was these rules right here, and I wanted to do it more or less, a little more detailed than just simply rolling a die and then based off of your die score, your arrow drifts to a certain point, or, you know, I, I didn't want to do something as simple as that, so I kind of tried to add a, a little bit more to it where you would have your archery target, you would pick the band that you wanted to shoot at, so you'd have a risk-reward element there based on what band you're shooting at. Obviously, if you're shooting at the bullseye in the middle, you have the opportunity to score much higher points, but if you fail to roll well enough, then you're going to drift off the target and you're not going to get any points for it. So there's a gold ring, a red ring, a blue ring, and a black ring, and each ring uh, has its own point totals, but as well as if you roll lower, you might drift into a lower point ring to score points. So if you do, um, let's say the gold ring, like I said, bullseye is worth 10, um, and you might be able to get in the gold band to get you 9 points, but the um, if you roll lower on the D10, you know, you might drift into the black band or the blue band and get very low point scores. So it's kind of a strategic, um, I wanted to add a strategic element to where who's ever playing against your opponent, you have to really make choices. Do you want to really go for the big points or maybe you want to shoot on the blue ring where um, you can only, maybe your max is scoring six points, but your minimum is scoring like, you know, four points. So you're not going to rack up as many points, but you can be kind of slow and steady as you go through the rounds of the, of the archery contest. So that's kind of what I my envisioned here to where it's simply not just rolling dice. It gives the players some more choices, some risk rewards, some strategic thinking on how they want to how they want to compete in this this particular event. So there's rules for that. There's also rules for splitting arrows. So if you're down like 12 points and it's your last shot, um, you can attempt to uh, split your opponent's arrow, which would you know essentially take his points away for that arrow and uh, his his shot and give it to you. So it's a way for um, you know to add like that dramatic element, like last last arrow. You know you got to split this arrow to win the win the contest. So I want to add that element in there. So that's kind of archery in a nutshell. Like I said, it's not traditional war gaming. It's more risk reward dice rolling but you know i felt like it needed to be in there it was a major part of knights of tournament um like i said people really like the robin hood theme for for medieval tournament as well so i wanted to put that in there for you guys you don't have to use it but it's there and it's been thought out and fleshed out and i think it's a pretty good system uh, that kind of captures um the feel for archery in, in medieval tournaments uh next up we have the creating your knight section uh, so right here, <clears throat> this kind of goes over the stat blocks for your knights and everything you can do right here. So it goes over, you know, strength, agility, charisma, movement, vitality, your um, combat stats are going to be charge, sustained, counter, defense. You're going to have stats for your armor, jousting, and archery. So it's a 12... Uh, it's a 12 stat block that you're going to be working out of here that you're going to have all your information. So you're going to choose your different classes. There's three different classes of knights. We're going to go over those in a second. You're also going to have a certain amount of experience points uh, at the start to uh, put into your knight so you can kind of flesh him out a little bit and kind of give him his own personality instead of just like, you know, generic Johnny the Knight rolling out off the assembly line like everybody else. You're going to be able to kind of add some different abilities based off your experience points and how you want to spend them uh, and kind of build your knight's personality right off the bat and then as you start playing, you know, he can grow more and more. You're also going to be able to choose your weapons and armor at this point. So, um, thing we did differently for Steel and Steed that we didn't do for Sons of Mars is when you create your knight for Steel and Steed, you're going to be not only choosing your abilities, but you're going to have different types of armor you're going to be able to choose to add to your knight. You're also going to have different types of weapons that you're going to be able to add to your knight, horses, all these different things to really kind of give your knight a very unique feel. So uh, this is all part of building your and creating your knight off the beginning. So you're going to be choosing weapons and armor, you're going to be choosing your abilities that you're going to be able to spend, as well as different classes. Uh, going down here, so the first uh, first class that we have here is going to be the Feudal Knight. So, Feudal Knight comes with, every Feudal Knight that you have has a special rule called Yes My Lord um, that kind of tries to encompass like the idea of you being a Feudal Knight and fighting for a Lord under a banner. So you're going to get bonuses for that. Every Knight's stat block that you see down here, um, they all start off bare bones and basic. So you're going to have like your strength, agility, charisma, all stuff's going to be at zero. You're going to have a movement of a four, vitality of an eight. Everything else is going to be the one. It's all going to be bare bones, and the changes that happen in there um, are going to be based off of the skills and abilities that you choose. So for skills and abilities down here in this section, um, you're going to see that each knight class has 12 that are built in. Six of them are going to be bonuses that you're going to get to, to build up your strength and agility. And then there'll be six other um, abilities that you'll be able to purchase that are going to be used for foot combat and kind of buffs to, to your knight um, down here. So that this is what you get to uh, pick from for this knight. Each knight, um, each knight class has different uh, abilities 
and but they're going to have the same kind of bonuses that you can pick like adding strength agility they're all going to have that but they will have different uh, skills that you can purchase down here for foot combat you're also going to have uh, four skills that you can purchase for jousting uh, each class has different skills, different unique skills for jousting, archery, and um, your your basic combat skills and ability down here. So uh, read through them when you're creating your knight and you want to choose what kind of class you want to use because each one of them has a very unique feel and different skills and kind of ways to build out your knight going forward. So this is kind of the layout that you're going to have for when you're creating your knight and the choices you're going to have to make as far as spending your skill points and what kind of knight you want to build. Because you might want to build a foot combat knight, so you might hang a little more heavily down here. Or maybe you want to build like your knight and be like, I want his strong suit to be jousting skills. So you might focus more on the jousting skill pool up here as well as purchasing skills and abilities for your horse, which you're going to get into a, in a moment as well. So, you know, there's all different ways for you to branch out and, and build your knight. Um, and really kind of fit a theme uh, for the individual knight that you want to build. So down here as well, this kind of tells you what you need to purchase. You need to, to go through and you're going to need to choose your primary weapon. You need to choose a mounted weapon. You have to get a horse. You have to get a lance. Choose your suit of armor and choose your bow. All these things when you're creating the knight, um, this all comes with the package. You don't have to worry about uh, purchasing these in, in a, a campaign setting. You get at least one of these items for everything. Uh, to start so you're kind of equipped to, to enter any type of tournament or any type of contest and be ready to go. So here we have the military order build. Uh, this is the military orders, you know, your your Knights Templar, your Hospitallers, you know, your Teutonic Knight, you know, anybody who's part of like that military, like religiously themed order uh, you're going to have here. They have a Day's Vault ability that comes stock with all these guys. And like I said, you get 25 points to kind of flesh out um, each one of these. And like I said, the archery skills, the jousting skills, the skills and abilities down here, they're all unique to the military order knight build. You're not gonna be able to get these anywhere else except for the plus one strength and agility, like I mentioned before. Now, down here, you're gonna have, um, you know, different skills like smite. There's stagger, aggressive, rally, focus, endurance. There's there's some different skills for jousting. You're gonna have daring, conviction, resilient. Uh, you're gonna get a boost to your jousting if you want. And then for archery skills, uh, fishtail, torque, porpoise. A lot of things that you're gonna see in the book. I tried to do a lot of research on jousting and archery and try to pull over. Um, a lot of the techniques and a lot of the terms and, and a lot of the you know the ways that those competitions perform and create skills for them and put them in here so it tries to give you a very authentic feel when you're playing the game like oh hey I'm doing an archery thing and like you know I'm gonna use the fishtail skill and like fishtail actually you know it's it's a thing in archery so I wanted to kind of translate that over to the rules and, and bring that in so these competitions feel unique and they make sense and you can kind of make a connection to reality to actual war gaming so this is the military order night right here uh, next up, we have a freelance knight. This is kind of, you know, your, your knight for hire. You know, they answer to no one except for coin. You know, that, that's kind of the feel here. So this is the free uh, the freelance knight um, class right here. They Everyone starts off, they get a sell sword ability. And then, you know, they get, you know, their unique jousting, their unique archery skills, and their unique combat skills as well, like swordsmanship, punish, titan, shield bash, dodge assistance. Um... And they have all different ones in there as well. And some of these, like I said, if you guys play Sons of Mars, you might hear some of the um, some familiar skills. Some of them that translated, I decided to bring over and and put into this rule set as well without changing the name. So you're gonna have some consistency if you're familiar with both rule sets. You'd be like, oh hey, I know what Shield Bash is, or I know what Titan is. I've used it before, and it just kind of just got pulled over. I didn't rename some of them. I just kind of brought them over because they still fit the Knights of Tournament theme and and the combat theme, and it just made sense to bring some of those skills over here and to help flesh out some of these uh these classes a little bit more. So those are the three core classes that you have. But like I said, you have lots of choices and options to um, really branch out and create all different types of freelance knights, military order knights, or feudal knights, just really based off of the build of decisions that you make going forward. Um, over here is the skills and abilities. Um, these are all the skills and abilities that you found inside the uh, skills and ability block, the combat block. So you're going to have all of these right here. Um, these are the jousting skills and abilities. Here are the archery skills and abilities. So you know you have like four pages. I forgot what the actual number is, but it's, it's probably close to about 40 skills, I think, um, 40 unique skills that you're going to be able to uh, assign to your, your knights and, and, you know, give them their own personality and their own advantages once you get into combats and different competitions. So that's what you're looking at right here. Um, next up, we have horses and lances. So for horses and lances, 
when you build your knight, there's four different horse builds that we put in Steel and Steed. So these are the different horses that you're going to use for jousting as well as mounted combat. They all have uh, different unique abilities that you'll be able to purchase for five points each. You can go in there. So if you want to get like a uh, extra jousting abilities, like kind of like bonds that you have with your horse and, and ways that you can use your horse in some of these competitions. You'll be able to purchase their skills as well for five points each, and each horse has three uh, unique skills each. So there's 12 skills in total, but each each horse only has three choices that you can go with, and they're kind of really geared toward the, the type of horse. So you have, you have um, the Destriere, Palfreys, the, uh, I'm probably butch butchering the way that you pronounce these. There's Rounceys in there and uh, Coursers. Each one, you know, we have a slow horse, which has more discipline and stability, so they're going to be better for jousting, but it's going to be a little bit harder for you to, to get that momentum to maybe land stronger hits. But they're, they're a horse that you can rely on. We have palfreys in here, which are, they they got a little bit of speed to them. Uh, you're very stable when you're riding it, but their discipline isn't as good, so it's going to be harder for you to win initiatives and maybe get off the line um, in these in these jousting contests to go first. The uh, the courser, this one right here, this is the fastest horse. Uh, very good at getting off the line, very quick. A lot of its uh, abilities are built toward that, but the stability for this horse is not good. So if you you know you might get there first and you're going to get there quick, but if you end up losing the combat, the chances of you getting knocked off your horse. Are, um, are better than most um, in, in, uh, compared to some of the other horses. Then we have the Rouncey, which is kind of like your general purpose horse. Average speed, average discipline, average stability, and the abilities that you get with the horse um, aren't very flashy, but they're all very useful. So, um, you know, you're going to pick the horse that's going to best fit your knight's play style, and then you're going to kind of want to build around that. And you know, like I said, each of these horses, you know, based on the different types of lances that you have down here, you have um, light lance, standard lance, and heavy lance. Some of these choices that you make, you're going to add extra dice to your dice pool, or they're going to add or reduce your stability because of the weight of the lance, but it's also going to add to your strength when you're jousting. So if you go with the heavy lance, you're going to have less dice to throw. If you lose, you're going to be less stable because you're using a heavier lance. But if you hit, you get a plus two to your strength, so your chance to dismount your opponent is going to be much better. So the combination of jousting techniques, what horse you're using, and what lance you're using, as well as the skills that you have for your horses and for your jousting abilities when you build your knight, all that stuff combined opens up a huge uh, amount of strategic decisions when you're uh, when you're jousting or when you're doing mounted combat. Uh, to where, like I said, it's not just a simple dice roller. You're going to be like thinking, and you're really going to be looking at like you know, okay, like what's the best choice for me to make as far as building this knight uh, for this competition, as well as once the competition takes place, um, you know, where can I put my like strategically. What am I going to attack against my opponent? Am I going to go for points and try to go for accuracy? Am I going to try to maybe start off and be like a heavier build where I can just kind of knock my opponent off his horse and maybe end this competition early? So all these combinations of things really kind of open up your your strategic decisions once you start letting the dice roll. And uh, that's kind of the, one of the big things that we wanted to do when we created this rule set was um, it's one thing to have just a lot of options in a game. But it's another thing to take those options and layer them and give players a, a lot of strategic decisions and, and let them kind of work their brain a little bit and, and make it feel like every choice they make every single turn has some weight to it. And, and you know, it's, it just goes beyond just simple dice results that you're rolling against each other. So this is kind of the first taste of that when you're making your choice for horses and lances and on all the variations that go into it. Uh, next up, we have a page for our horse's abilities. This kind of just goes over all the different abilities that you're going to get um, with your horse. And like I said, you can use your experience points that you gain to purchase abilities um, for your horse instead of your knight. And it's kind of a way to you know form that bond. And some of these are really useful. Well, I mean, all of them are useful. But, you know, depending on what kind of build that you're building with your knight, you might find some of these mesh a lot better with your build than other ones. And you just kind of have to just go through and, and, and you know, make those decisions as you build and progress in the campaign and, and continue to build your knight. Uh, over here we have the bows. So the bows, you're going to have options for a short bow, a standard bow, and a long bow. Um, obviously, you know, they're going to do different things where your short bow is going to be more about accuracy, but it's going to be harder for you to split arrows. Your standard bow is just your standard bow. You're not really going to get any bonuses for it. Um, you're just going to be like plain Jane with that one. And then your long bow, um, you're not going to be as accurate with it, but you're going to have a little more strength behind it. Um, so it's going to be easier for you to split opponent's arrows and do things like that. So this is, you know, another choice when you're building your knight, you're going to look at it and say like, okay, like how do I want to, 
build my knight for archery and and what equipment I'm going to use to kind of um, kind of push that that strategic element forward and, and make my knight the best at this particular style of, of archery. So that's what we're looking at right there. We're on page 48 and 49 right now, going into 50 and 51. You guys want to hang out with me for just one second. I'm just trying to get this lined up over here. All right, <clears throat> so page 50, we start getting into armor choices. So, um, excuse me, get something to drink. Um, so when you're... Uh, building knight, you're gonna have to choose your armor. Your armor, once you wear your armor, you're kind of stuck with it. You can't like uh, go to a tournament and uh, be like, okay, I'm gonna switch my plate armor to my parade armor when you go from single combat to mounted combat. The reason, I mean, obviously historically, you know, you could do that. That that wasn't a thing, but for gameplay purposes, uh, we kind of wanted to shoe you into what you're gonna be for that entire tournament. So you have to make some more strategic decisions. Like, you know, hey, I got this tournament right here. There's jousting and foot combat. So which armor am I gonna choose? Am I gonna choose my parade armor, which is a little bit lighter on the armor, but I get better agility and stability. Or I wanna maybe go with my plate armor where, uh, you know, I get a vitality bonus, uh, which might be better for standard combat, or you go with the plate armor with the, the hauberk, which is going to give you a much better, you're going to get a plus three armor opposed to a plus two, but you're going to take hits for agility and stability. So uh, your armor that you're going to choose for your knight, you can purchase more armor as the campaign goes on and you can switch it out, but you can only really use it, you can only make that choice at the beginning of a tournament, not for each competition within the tournament. So this is, like I said, another layer of you... Um, for you to make decisions about your knight, how you want them to play, and then how you want that armor to play off of different equipment. Because you know you might go with the plate mail with the hauberk, which has a higher armor school, uh, armor score, which might lend itself to you using two-handed weapons more often in one-on-one -on -one combat. But at the same time, your agility and your stability take a hit, and that means when you're jousting, you're gonna it's gonna be much easier for you to get dismounted when you're doing that. So like I said, lots of strategic choices here based on the equipment that you choose and the play styles that you want to use uh, when you go into these tournaments. Uh, next page over here on 51 on the right hand side these are the single-handed weapons so you're gonna have options to choose uh, between a tar shield and a kite shield obviously the kite shield is gonna give you a little more armor protection but the tar shield is gonna give you um, the parry ability with a little less armor so you know that's the choice you have to make with single-handed weapons for single-handed weapons right now this is what we have um, these are a lot of the traditional weapons that you're gonna see in Knights of Tournament in Europe uh, we'll probably add to this list at some point to come up with some really good ideas and some other things, and we'll, we'll probably release that as free content um, going forward. You know, I, I don't have anything set up. Like for those of you who play Sons of Mars, you guys know that every couple months I'll put out like a free content pack, like four or five pages of additional content to add to the games. Um, I want to do that with this as well. It just comes down to. Um, you know how frequently we're going to do it and what content's going to be coming out with it. Nothing's set in stone yet, but know that that is a plan to, to additionally like drip feed out some free content and continue to support the community going forward. So um, just be aware of that. Like you know, the book is loaded with stuff, and uh, we still do plan on adding things to it later. And uh, a bulk of it will be free. Just kind of just ways to say thank you for playing the game and and continuing to support the game. So back to the single-handed weapons. We have, um, like I said, those two shield choices that you're going to have. Also for single-handed weapons, you're gonna have an arming sword, the uh, falchion, the mace, a morning star, a flail, a war hammer, and a battle axe. These are gonna be all of your single-handed weapons that you can either um, arm yourself with the shield or you just arm it by itself without a shield and just use it single-handed. Uh, the dice pools for single-handed weapons, you're gonna have less dice to throw at your opponent, but at the same time, you're armed Excuse me, you're arming yourself with a shield, so your armor is going to be higher. So for those of you who like using single-handed weapons, you won't be throwing as many dice at your opponent, but you're going to have better protection uh, going forward. And also, each of the weapons, um, not each of them, but most of them, do have um, special abilities attached to them that go off when you get a critical success. So, you know, this... It, you know, you're going to have some more abilities than just the core abilities that you build with your knight. Your weapons are also going to have abilities attached to them, uh, which can go off in combat. Um if you roll critical successes. So these are the single-handed weapons. Over here we have our double-handed weapons as well. So you're gonna have the choice, you can use a spear, a long sword, a Danish ax, a halberd, a maul, and a pole ax for your double-handed weapons. The double-handed weapons, since obviously you can't, you're not carrying a shield with them, you're gonna be a little bit more susceptible um, with a weaker armor save, but you have much higher dice pools and the abilities that 
um, go with these weapons are a little bit more devastating and plentiful. So it's kind of a choice you have to make as your knight. You want to go with the double-handed weapons and try to really be that beat stick and just you know take your opponent out quickly, or do you want to kind of play it a little bit safer and maybe bump your armor save, throw less dice with less devastating abilities, but you have the chance to kind of stay into the fight longer and hang in there if maybe the dice aren't uh, aren't rolling your way throughout the the fight. So that's your choice here with double-handed weapons. Like I said, we we. We'll probably add some extra things to this, but the, what you have in the book right now are the traditional Knights of Tournament uh, weapons, and we might expand on that maybe before launch or after launch. I don't know yet, but it, it you know there, there is potential for these um, for the, there to be more weapons added. We also have mounted weapons. The mounted weapon is um, so to go back to this here. Um, so when you're fighting in mounted combat, not jousting, but actual mounted combat, um, you can use your single-handed weapons with the shield for mounted. Um, Double-handed weapons, you cannot use um, when you're mounted in combat. So if, you're mount if you start off mounted, you're gonna have to use a single-handed weapon. Uh, and if you get dismounted, you can call to your squire to switch out to a double-handed weapon if you have those in your arsenal already. The mounted weapons, this is um, it's a knight's lance, not a jousting lance, a knight's lance and a heater shield. So these two you can give to your knight when you're fighting in mounted combat, not jousting. Like this is actual mounted combat. You can use these two, but you can only use the mounted. Once you get dismounted, uh, you're going to have to drop the knight's lance. You're going to have to signal to your, um, to your squire to bring you over either a double-handed weapon when you're on foot or your single-handed weapon um, combination on foot. And that's what you use uh, when you're on the ground. So like I said, the Knight's Lance, extremely devastating on the charge. You get a lot of dice for that. You also get the Impale um, ability, which you know, is really devastating as well on the charge. So it's it's a great weapon to have when you're mounted. But like I said, at the same time, um, you're going to have to burn an action or two or, or wait for a good situation if you get dismounted to um reset your equipment and get and get a different weapon for when you're fighting on foot so like i said there's just a couple other elements that you're going to make to uh when you're creating your knight and outfitting your knight strategically and what choices you're going to have to make to to get that kind of fight style that you want uh next page is the weapons abilities this kind of just goes over what abilities you have for your weapons that are attached to your weapons and what they do so as you guys can see there's there's a lot of different abilities in here uh whether it's attached to your to your uh, knight whether it's attached to his weapons his horses different equipment. Uh, there's all different sorts of abilities. I think overall, I think right now it's it's pushing 50, maybe close to 60 for the, you know, it might even be a little more than that, but I think it's between 50 and 60, somewhere in that range um, for just the abilities that you're going to be able to, to have for Steel and Steed. Uh, next up on page 54, we're looking at the campaign. So this kind of just goes over um, how to set up a, a, an ongoing campaign with yourself or your gaming group. Like I said, the, the game is balanced to whether you want to play it solo and use uh, NPC nights and um, the NPC houses that we've created so you can play solo or you can add some friends with your gaming group or maybe have one buddy who's interested in playing this. You can play with just you know human opponents if you want or you can play with a mix of human opponents as well as filling in the gaps with NPCs. It's really kind of however you want to do it, but we just tried to give you guys the tools to um to create a campaign that works for you and your gaming group because like I said we all don't play we all play differently we all enjoy games for different reasons so we want to kind of make it a flexible system to where you can pick up the book and you can kind of build a campaign an ongoing campaign the way you want to play it and, and what best suits you so that's kind of just like you know the opening to the campaign section uh, next up is your nightly house and and how this goes with the campaign so you start off you're just building one night and it's kind of the story of your night as you kind of grow in the you know this fame and fortune or, or maybe you fall by the wayside but we'll, we'll say this is going to start off on a positive note for you um so you start off as, as your night however you decide to build them out and then based on um you know what tournaments you participate in and what place you come into you're gonna you're gonna gain gold and prestige and you're gonna be able to to kind of build your knightly house up in the summit so you'll be able to purchase a, a castle or a keep there's gonna be castle upgrades that you're gonna be able to purchase with gold this is all gold purchases right here you'll be able to recruit other knights uh, there's gonna be ransoms to pay so you know if um you know, you lose in a grand melee or you know specific kind of duel, which is what we're going to get into in a second. There's going to be ransoms to pay, so you pay that ransom and you're able to get your equipment back or you know whatever you lost, and you're going to be able to continue forward uh, and use that knight in other competitions. Also, you're going to be able to buy equipment. 
Uh, so personally, weapons, different armor or horses, it's just uh, 10 gold pieces across the board for each purchase. So it's um, you just kind of pick the item you want and it costs you 10, 10 uh, gold for the equipment. So that's how you purchase with gold. You can also buy prestige back if you want to make like a donation to a lord. Um, or, or something along those kind of lines. For every 10 gold that you put down, you can get one prestige point um, to use to spend toward different things that you're going to be um, purchasing with prestige. So like I said, with gold, it's like the castle, all the castle upgrades, uh, recruiting knights, paying ransoms, buying equipment, buying prestige. Those are the things that you can do with gold. Uh, for earning and spending gold, so when you're fighting in tournaments, if you place first, second, or third, you're gonna earn a certain amount of prestige, a certain amount of gold, um, experience points, things like that, depending on where you place, you're going to get these bonuses. Uh, usually the rule we have in here, like I said, you can make these adjustments. These are your campaigns. You can do whatever you want. But um, the way we have it set up is 50% of your winnings go to your knight directly, and then the other 50% are given to the house. And it's because you're going to have certain things that you're going to be able to do just with your knight. Not experience points. Experience points will go strictly to your knight. But uh, prestige and gold, you're going to put those 50% into your knight for them to make their own purchases and build that up. But the idea is 50% goes to the house because you're not only building up the individual knight, you're building up your banner. You know what I mean? Like you're building up, you know, whatever knightly house you fight for, whether it's an order or, you know, you're fighting for a certain lord in a certain area. Like half of the fame and fortune that you're going to accumulate is going to go toward towards your banner, you know, towards your crest, towards your house. So that's kind of the idea here. You get 50%, 50% goes to the house. Uh, when you're playing inside a, a campaign, and like I said, if if you don't want to do that, that's up to you. You know, you you make the decisions. I'm saying this is just, just what we have set in the game. But like I said, if you want to do a campaign differently, you just make the adjustments and 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 do what you guys enjoy. That's what's most important to get out of this. Is you know, we're just laying the framework and the groundwork here. But make the adjustments for yourselves and just get the most out of the game, the most enjoyment that you can get out of it. Uh, going to the next page. This goes over. Uh, you purchasing a small castle and what you get with it, like how many knights that you can house there, how many extra horses, um, storage to house, you know, uh, captured knights equipment for ransom and things like that. It's castle upgrades, you can purchase extra bedrooms, a larger stable, uh, training grounds for your knights to go practice, the tilt yard to practice jousting. Uh, same thing with archery range. You can purchase a, a large banner to kind of hang off of your keep and that's going to do things like um, you're going to be able to start competitions with favor die. Um, extra favor die and things like that. So each of these castle upgrades you can purchase after you purchase the castle to kind of, you know, build a more prestigious place for your for your knights to be housed at. There's also rules here, like I said, for recruiting knights, for paying ransoms to get your equipment back, buying equipment, buying prestige. We kind of just went over all that, but this is the kind of things that you can purchase with gold. Um, next up, you have your purchase that you can do with prestige. So obviously, you know, it's like your renown. You win a contest um, and then you're kind of able to uh, get the fame that comes with it. So these are the things that you can buy with prestige points uh, when you win these competitions. Place first, second, or third, you're able to get some extra. Um, you're able to get some extra things for that. So what you can purchase is titles. You're able to get two um, throughout the campaign. Each night, you're able to kind of get different types of titles based on how much prestige that you want to spend on it. So you can get titles that have to do with your personality um, or titles that have to do with combat. So you say, hey, I want to get a, um, a personality title right now. You can get like, you know, Joe the Brave or, you know, Sir Joe the Ruthless. You roll a D10, you, you pay your 20 prestige, and then you roll on the table, and that's that's kind of what you get. So it's, it's a toss of the dice. All of them give you a bonus. Um, just some are better than others. And once you get that title, you can't lose it. So you, get, you can get up to one personality title, one combat title. Um, and once you get it, you're just stuck with it. That's, that's, your, that's your knight. That's what you get. So... You can purchase titles um, right here, and these kind of go over what they are. There's 20 different titles for you to get in two different tables, um, and those are spent with prestige points that you gain as you win tournaments. Uh, next up, uh, another option that you have because it just fits into the whole theme is if you want to court a fair maiden. So you spend your prestige, and you're able to go out, and you roll on this D10 table, and there's 10 fair maidens here. Each one of them gives you a different type of bonus to your character, whether it's influenced by her father, which can get you like you know free horses during the year, or maybe you know you get extra prestige when you win tournaments. Each there, each one of these, uh, each one of these fair maidens um, give you some sort of bonus during campaign play. It costs you 10 prestige points to even go out and try to court them. So what ends up happening is. Um, you go out, you roll on the table, and let's just say you get Matilda of Lyon is, is who you get. It's like the number six. 
So um, her big thing is that like you have to dress and present yourself um, to the nines every time you go out. So your night maybe roll um, all charisma tests if if you win her hand. But to win her hand, uh, you have to go out there and you have to uh, win a tournament and dedicate all of its winnings to her. And if you do that, you roll on a, you roll a die, and on a six plus, she accepts your gifts and she'll take your hand in marriage. Um, if she if you roll less than a six, and this goes with every every one of these, if you roll less than a six, then she kind of rejects your advances and. Um, she, she doesn't want to be with you so you you and you still lose um, all the gifts that go to it but the catch is um, you only get two attempts to do this so if you fail twice at you know winning a tournament and dedicating your winning to her um, that that opportunity is lost and you'll have to spend 10 more prestige to try to win another maidens um, another maidens favor and win her hand so there's also rules in here if you have multiple knights courting the same mating uh, uh, the same maiden how um, how that plays out and what the rules are for that. So like I said, there's a whole layer here for, you know, courting fair maidens and getting that whole chivalry thing kind of rolling in the campaign. So you have rules for that as well. And that's all fleshed out right here. Uh, we also have challenges built into the campaign. So obviously, you know, you're going to be facing off against whether it's your buddies or NPCs or however, however it goes off. You're going to start to have these rivalries as you're knocking each other out of these out of these tournaments. And, you know, some of you are winning glory and the other ones are kind of just getting left in the dust. There's going to be some, you know, you know, some light animosity between players and, and different characters. So we add the, the challenges in here where you can call out one of your opponents uh, for a certain amount of prestige. And you can call them in for an honor duel, like a one-on-one -on -one contest. You guys decide the terms for it. You decide, you know, the prize for it. it it's pretty much, you know, me against you. Let's figure out what's on the table and what we're going to fight for. And um, so there's there's rules for you to have honor duels against other against other opponents that you choose, and it costs you a certain amount of prestige points to um, to ask for this honor duel. And then obviously, if you reject it. If you're on the other end, there's penalties for it, and, and there's a whole rule system for that. There's also blood feuds as well in campaign. So if you have a knightly house, and let's say um, your opponent, you know, maybe he kills one of your knights in in jousting, or maybe he lands a death blow in one-on-one -on -one combat, there's rules in here for blood feuds for like you to kind of go back and regain the honor of your house or avenge your dead um, your dead brother. Um, in combat, so there's rules for blood feuds as well, and they work very similarly to challenges, but there's some there's some different layers to it as far as the uh, prestige points, experience points, um, and what the results are from these blood feuds and, and these different combats. So these are different things that you can do uh, when challenging your opponent. Uh, let's see what else we got down here. Um, there's also uh, for entering special events. So throughout the the year, you're going to have uh, regular like local and regional tournaments that you can kind of enter with your knight that don't really cost anything for prestige, but you're going to have special events that you can answer, uh, enter as well. Uh, these are like um, very prestigious tournaments that you're going to enter into, and it's going to cost you prestige to get into these. So that's kind of explains how you have to pay with prestige to uh, get into these special events to compete in these tournaments against much better knights, but they also have much better payouts. Uh, there's also rules in here for paying ransoms with prestige. Uh, so obviously you can pay with gold if you have it in your treasury to um, get your knight's ransomed equipment back from an opponent. Or if you choose, you can pay with prestige if you don't want to use gold, but paying with prestige, I mean, it's a gameplay element, but it's it's pretty much in it's it's the idea that you show up and instead of paying gold you um you bend the knee to your opponent and admit defeat and admit that they're the better man in combat and you know they give you the equipment back uh you paying that way opposed to you paying with with gold so that's just another way for you to pay ransoms back if you don't have the money to do it you might have to hang your head in shame and bend the knee to your opponent to get your equipment back or you just bench your guy and wait until you have enough of money to go buy back his equipment if you choose not to bend the knee. So that's just like another way to use your prestige. Uh, next up here on page 63, this is experience points. Uh, this just kind of goes over, you know, you participate in a match, you defeat an opponent in a match, um, you know, different ways for you to get experience points. Uh, if you win by death blow, if you uh, defeat a champion class opponent, uh, these are all different ways 
for you to gain experience points and those experience points obviously build up and add up and that's what you spend on uh, purchasing new skills and abilities for your knights. Uh, so there's ways to get it for regular tournament uh, play and, and you know campaign play, just showing up to the contest and tournaments. There's also a separate uh, set of experience points rules if you're doing those honor duels or blood feuds, um, how you can gain experience points for that. Um, going forward. There's also, if you win tournaments or place in tournaments, you get bonus experience points for that. So there's different ways for you to gain experience points throughout the uh, campaign uh, from just winning basic matches to winning tournaments to winning um, duels uh, going forward. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do it. Also down here, there's a section on how you purchase your skills and, and, and you know use your experience points to make your knights better. So this is the experience points section here on page 63. Uh, next up goes over the campaign calendar um, and how the schedule works, you know, as far as like each week of the month, what you can do in each one of those weeks and where regional tournaments fall and special events and things of that nature. This kind of goes over the basic rules for that. Uh, next up is regional tournaments. So this is kind of like your common tournament that you're going to run into once a month that you just kind of send your knights into. You roll a d10, it's one event, so it can be either archery, one-on-one -on -one foot combat, one-on-one -on -one mounted combat, or jousting. Uh, so that's what you run into for your regional tournaments. Uh, you roll the d10, you get one event, so it'll be one of those things I just mentioned, and it's an eight-night tournament, and then you end up rolling if you need to, depending on how many people you have playing in your campaign, you roll on the NPC uh, table, and it tells you what quality of knight uh, is going to be placed in the tournament, whether you know you need seven of them or, or one of them. You just roll on this table, and it tells you um, what quality of knight you go into. And we'll get into the NPC tables in a second to kind of show you how that's that's broken down. But there's common knights, veteran knights, and champion knights. And then for the regional tournament, if you place first, second, or third, uh, this is what you get. So for first prize, you get three bonus experience points, 10 prestige points, and 20 gold. Second prize is two bonus experience points, five prestige points, 10 gold. And third, third prize is one bonus experience point, three prestige points, and five gold. So, you know, the, the payouts aren't that great for regional tournaments, but you don't have to pay any prestige or gold to get into them. It's just you kind of show up, you participate in the tournament. It's kind of a way for you to, to build up your treasury, build up a little prestige, build up a little bit of experience points, and slowly grow your knights as you've built towards some of these bigger special events. So um, that's how regional uh, tournaments work. This goes into special events right here. Um, the next page on page 66 tells you how the special events work. They're, they're only every couple months. You're not going to get them every month. So, you know, first one we have here is called the Frozen Feathers Tournament. This one's based more on one-on-one -on -one foot competition and archery. So, um, and like I said, you get unique prizes for this. And um, you're going to face probably better knights depending on how you roll. But usually for these, these special events, you're going to be facing more veteran knights and champion knights. Not so much your common knights that you're going to see more in um in regional events so the first one you're going to get in frozen feathers it costs you five prestige to get into it per night and then um you know it has its own rules and its own theme going forward uh some of the other ones you have is twin blades this is like a two-on-two -two night tournament so like day one you have the two-on-two -two combat tournament and then day two is the banquet and like the banquet you're gonna see the banquet for each one of these special events it's the last day that's kind of when they have a feast and they hand out the prizes for uh, for all the contests and, and recognize the knights that performed well in these things. So that's what the banquet is, if you're wondering if you can see that on the screen right now. So um, that's Twin Blades. There's also Clash of Steel. That's the Grand Melee where like um, you're going to, you know, you can submit your knight to fight in this, you know, random grand melee tournament on foot. So, you know, you get you get paired off with three other random knights and you form a team and then um, you fight against your opponent um their their team and then <clears throat> based off of whoever wins it's like a it's a one contest grand melee event and whoever wins that you get experience points prestige and gold for it so that's uh, clash of steel that one's in june uh going forward you have the golden lance invitational this one's all about mounted combat so you're looking at one-on-one -on -one mounted combat a jousting competition um, this one it's very prestigious uh so it's 10 there's 10 points to get into it but your prizes are also uh, a notch above what some of the other tournaments are. So this is the Golden Lance. This is more about horseback um, combat as well as jousting. Uh, next one in October is called the Banner Games. This is where um, you're going to bring your whole house to tournaments. So if you have like four knights, you bring you and four knights. Each knight can participate in one competition. And at the end of it, whatever house has the most points um, accumulated over the series of these competitions, 
uh, you know, they end up winning the banner games. So it's 20 prestige points for your house to get in to, to get into this one. You bring four knights each night participate in one of the competitions. You're gonna have archery, one on one mounted, one on one foot jousting, and then the last day is gonna be the banquet. Um, and we also have it set up so you know. If you have players, four players that can all bring their house to participate, fantastic. If you only have, like, maybe playing solo or maybe you only have, like, one buddy, in the NPC section, we also have some, um, we also have houses set up so you can bring in NPC houses to fill in the gaps. So this is the Banner Games. This takes place in October. This is, like, a, a big tournament for the houses, not just the individual knights. Uh, give me one second here as I scroll down on the side of the screen so I can get to the next page. All right, so next up we have Tournament of Champions. This is in December. This is the last tournament of the year. This is where it's 20 prestige points for you per night. Uh, and this is when, you know, you send your knight in here. This is like the cream of the crop, and, you know, the knights participate in everything. So you got uh, archery, one-on-one -on -one foot contest, and jousting. So the three core things for knights of tournament, um, you're submitting your knight to participate in each of those events, and then at the end of it, the overall best... Um, the best score wins the entire competition. You're the most well-rounded knight um, in the land, pretty much is how it goes. So this is the Tournament of Champions. It's the last contest that you're going to have in the calendar year um, for the campaign. And then, like I said, if, if you just want to do one year, it would end here, and that would kind of just be the story of your knight. If you want to, you roll over and you, you just do another year. Like I said, every year that you, every campaign that you play, every year that you play, because all the random elements as far as the how the tournaments are laid out, and your opponents and the stuff that unfolds each year is going to play very differently as far as results go so i mean like i said you can play like a 10 20 year campaign if you want to get that far into it um and and each year will feel very different than the previous one so you know it's you just kind of set the end game up to how you want to do it if you want to play like you know a quick quick campaign with your buddies and just do like you know this this snippet this you know this one year in the story of wherever you're you're placing your uh, your campaign you do it that way or you can do this long rolling campaign where you kind of just build this narrative up and build these rivalries and build these stories over a series of years it's really up to you like i said it's it this is more of a toolbox this rule set you know we we set all this stuff in there uh with the general idea of how we like to play we also like to leave it um loose and flexible so the, whoever picks up the book and whoever wants to play can kind of create this environment and this campaign that kind of fits the way that you want to play as well so like i said you, you set these campaigns up we, we put the tools in there you kind of just build how you want to build it uh, over here on page 75 we have some optional campaign rules um these like i said these are bolt-on rules so if you want to add these in there fantastic um if you don't you just leave them out and um like i said like how i mentioned with the weapons before um uh, as we keep playing as the community keeps playing and suggestions continue to get made we'll keep adding this to to free content and like if you have some cool campaign ideas that maybe you guys are using send them in we'll we'll play test them and kind of get them tweaked so they're they're balanced and they kind of fit into the core rules really well and we'll start presenting that to the community as free content and be like hey here's a balanced rule from such and such um, that you can add into your campaigns as an optional campaign rule. So what we have is we are not created equal is our main one. And uh, this one is for uh, character creation. So instead of just having the basic core stat block, you go through a lot of your abilities like strength, agility, charisma, movement, and vitality, and you roll on a D10 table. And based on your result there, you can start off with a plus one strength, or maybe your knight's not very good, and you might get like a minus one strength, or maybe if you roll like a three to an eight, there's no change at all. So you go through your core, um, your core uh, abilities for your knight, and you roll on each one of them. And then, you know, it kind of adds a little bit of flexibility and flavor to, to each night that you create because, you know, we're not all created equal. Some of us excel at certain things. Some of us might just be a complete freak and are absolutely amazing in everything, strength, agility, charisma, movement, vitality. And, you know, some of us might just be an absolute slob and, you know, might get like negative bonuses for each of those. So that's kind of an optional rule right here if you want to have a little bit more uh variables and variants and, and you know when you're building your knights this is a really good rule for that uh bleeding out is another one we put in there so um fatigue is part of the core rule set if you get to a negative three penalty um you can't get any more than that so the idea behind bleeding out is once you get to negative three any other fatigue penalty that you take that would take you to a negative four or above that um you would take you would lose a point of vitality at that point so your hit points would go down if you get over fatigued past that negative three penalty that's the bleeding out rule um 
that's something that you can add to uh, add to your campaigns because you know fatigue does play a major factor, but it does cap out at some point. So you know if you keep getting hit when you're at max fatigue, this is kind of a good way to continue to penalize your opponent opposed to um, or penalize a player opposed to just sitting at max fatigue. And, you know, you might be taking additional fatigue, but it doesn't really mean anything at that point. So that's what the bleeding out rule is. Uh, we also added in injuries. So um, for Sons of Mars, we had injury tables and a whole lot of other things because, you know, it's gladiators. They were slaves. It kind of fit the theme. You know, these guys are fighting to the death constantly. Not to the death all the time, but there's there's that fear of death every time you would go into the arena. For Knights of Tournament, um, there isn't as much of that. And you kind of think too, you're you're fully clad in armor, so the the chances of you getting seriously injured, um, they're still there, but I don't think they were as prominent. So uh, we added in the injury um, injury rules as a bolt on. So if you end up uh, losing uh, in a contest in foot combat or whatever, you roll a d10 and on the roll of a one you're considered to be injured in some fashion, and then you just roll a D5, and that's how many months um, you would, your knight would be on the shelf uh, going forward. So there's no way to die from injuries uh, with this optional rule. It's just kind of ways to, you have to shelf your knight for a couple months as he, as he heals. So the only way that you would really die in the campaign is like we mentioned before on that jousting table if you roll a one, or if somebody lands a death blow against you uh, in combat. Because we don't want we don't want knights to be dropping like flies when we're playing. This is um, this is more about the story of your knight and building it up, opposed to running a Lanista. I mean, being a Lanista, running a Ludus with gladiators. It's a very different feel. So we didn't want to have the injury part of it and the death part of it be as prominent um, when you're playing in a campaign. So like I said, these are optional rules, and like I said, you can make tweaks to these any way you want. Like I said, I mean, it's your campaign. It's how you're playing it. Just you know, talk to the guys that you're playing with. Make sure everybody's on the same play, uh, same page, so you guys can enjoy. You know every level of the uh, of the campaign and how you want to build it. Uh, next up, we start getting into the NPCs. So um, the NPCs, we have thirty NPCs. They're broken down into common, veteran, and champion knights. Uh, each one of them has uh, a name, a military order, or feudal order. You know they're they're attached to something. They have a unique name. They have. Um, they're part of one of the three uh, different classes, and they're all fleshed out with different rules. Your common knights are obviously going to be um, your bottom of the barrel knights or your up and coming knights. Nothing very special. Your veteran knights are going to have more experience, so they're going to have more skills, uh, probably some better weapons. Um, you know, a little more well rounded. And then your champion knights, that's going to be like the cream of the crop. So if you draw one of those guys, you know it's going to be a really tough fight. So. What we have lined up right here, um, I'll just go over like how it lays out. So you're going to have, this is Leonard Weber of the Order of the Sacred Cross and the Sacred Cross. Order of the Sacred Cross is one of the major um, knightly houses that you're going to find with the NPCs. It's a common military order knight. So you're going to have the stat block like you would for your knight. Uh, has dice pools, his abilities. Uh, down here, you're going to see, since he's a common knight, he really doesn't have that much to build from. So he's going to have a charge plus one for his skills and abilities. He's going to be outfitted with, uh, outfitted with a mace and a tar shield. He has plate armor, he has a rouncy horse, he uses a light lance and a longbow. So everything you need, uh, no matter what kind of competition that you're using, uh, what competition you're fighting in or participating in, you have everything you need with this NPC on this page, and that goes all the way down. Like going down, you know, we got Chester Ainsworth, Order of the Sacred Cross, we got Philip Dubois, Knights of St. Joseph, and each one of these knights has different, um, different equipment, different horses, different skill sets. So... You know, you might roll up a NPC, we'll just say like Chester Ainsworth right here. You might roll up him and it might be an archery contest. Well, he sucks at archery, he has no skills, he has a very basic bow. He's not bringing anything to the table for that. So if you get him for an archery competition, he's going to be a pushover opponent. But if say you bring him in and it's a jousting competition, this guy's more built for the joust. He has a better joust dice pool. He has a skill to go with it. Um, so you're going to have, um, depending on what kind of... Uh, contests you roll up for the tournaments you're participating in some npcs are going to be you know they're going to be able to punch above their weight and other ones you're going to have guys in there that just they're not built for it so there might kind of be a pushover in the tournament and the same goes for your um for your knights too depending on how you build them so like i said it just kind of depends on what the competition is and who's in it and then you're going to get a very different feel um for these knights like they're going to excel in certain areas and they're not going to be as good as other ones so um if I scroll down, I mean, we got like 30 knights all together. Where are the veteran knights? So here's some veteran knights, as you can see. Um, they're stat blocks. Uh, this is James Garrick of the Knights of St. Joseph. 
Uh, like I said, each one has a unique name. We wanted to add that in there so, you know, when you compete against these guys, you can kind of almost build like that history in the back of your head of when you when you face these guys and, and kind of build a story as well. So um, his stat block, you can see his stats are a little bit better. He has more skills and abilities in a lot of these areas. Like, you know, he's built more for archery. So he has fishtail, torque, archery plus one. Uh, his weapon loadouts, um, you know, he has that there. So you go through here and like I said, this is just kind of the veterans um, loadout. So they're going to have more skills more abilities. There's gonna they're gonna be a tougher opponent going forward. Uh, going here we have so here are the champions. Let me get down another page here. So um, as you can see the champions they're loaded out way more. They're gonna have better hit points. They're most likely gonna have better skills, better dice pools. They're gonna have they're gonna be loaded out with skills and abilities as you guys can see. Like they have much more uh, going forward. Um, as well as usually they have like some guys right here, you know, they both have abilities with their horse. So that's added into their jousting skills and ability as well. Um, their weapons, their, the, the common gladiators, they're not as fine tuned and they're supposed to be like that because they, they're supposed to be an easier opponent for the player. Um, you're supposed to be favored in those fights. So they're going to have less hit points. They're going to be less fine tuned as far as their skills and equipment go. Um, they're set up to where you're going to have the advantage when you fight them. When you fight a veteran knight, the idea is to have a, a fairly level playing field. And once you face off against these champion knights, depending on where you are in your campaign and the quality of the knight you've created, um, these guys are loaded out and like they're fine tuned to where they're skills, their equipment, their horse, their armor, they all really complement each other very well. They're very fine-tuned. So when you face these guys, um, you're really going to be in for like a really, really good fight. And when you, you know, if you win, you're going to feel like you earned it against these guys. Like these guys are definitely a step up in competition. So um, like I said, we got 30, uh, 30 in total for all these knights. And that's, you know, that's kind of the lay of the land on how they work. Each one has its own personality as far as skills, abilities, weapons. So like every one that you put out on the table, they're gonna have a very unique feel to it. Uh, uh, right here, this goes all the way to page 108. These are the NPC combat tables. So for those of you that are doing solo play, or maybe um, if you're doing like a two-man campaign but you don't wanna play against each other all the time, for combat, you can go into uh, NPC combat tables. So it goes through uh, whether your guy is a charge build, sustain build, counter attack build. You're gonna decide that based on uh, your your opponent's stat block plus whatever weapon he's using, you're gonna combine that. Whatever one is the highest uh, dice pool, whether it's charge, sustained, or counter, you're gonna to refer to this table, and that's kind of kind of the table that you're gonna roll on for combat. Um, and what you're gonna to have to choose between is if you're engaged, like toe to toe. There's an engaged side, and then there's a disengaged side. If you're not standing toe to toe, what your guy would do. So you roll a d10. It would kind of give you, hey, this is what you're gonna do. Go do it. But obviously, you know this can only cover so much. So you as the player, obviously, you're gonna to have to make a lot of decisions too. Like if it's the last round of a one-on-one -on -one combat and um, you guys are disengaged and maybe you roll for your opponent, like, you know, you roll something where, oh, he's gonna rest. Well, it's like, it's the last round of combat. He needs to go in there and, and take you down to, to win. Obviously, it makes more sense for him to move in and fight. So um, you as a player, you know, you're gonna to have to make some of those decisions occasionally where do I follow the result on the table or do I do what makes more sense? Um, do I, or do I do what makes more sense for this situation? So that, that responsibility, so we put the, this out there as a general guideline, but there's some situations where the player is gonna to have to make the common sense call uh, for certain situations. So these are the NPC combat tables. This is, um, this is gonna be for foot combat, uh, mostly, and you can also kind of use it for mounted combat. When it comes to jousting, it's very fluid um, and different depending on the situation. So uh, you're going to have to kind of make those decisions based off your opponent for jousting, like what kind of horse they have, their their weapon, uh, their lance, and then things like that. You're going to make those decisions as well. Or you just do standard across the board and just let the chips fall as they may. Uh, after this, we get to page 110. This is when you start getting like quick reference sheets. So here's the quick reference sheet. We're gonna have a PDF of all this stuff that you can download on our website, godseyegames.com. Uh, you can go there. We'll have all the quick reference sheets for you to d download in uh, PDF form, or like I said, you're gonna have these in the back of the book if you wanna photocopy it, or if you just wanna refer to the back of the book. Uh, this one uh, laid out, like a lot of these are laid out very similarly to what we had for Sons of Mars. So you know, here you're gonna have how the round of combat plays out. Uh, how to determine your attack dice pool, uh, how to determine your armor saves, how to do your attribute tests, how to decide initiative, fatigue, 
how you get favor dice, how you use favor dice, like that's all gone over right here. These are the most common things you're gonna run into. Also a list of the actions, so you don't need to constantly refer to the book. You can just kind of look in here and be like, oh hey, I'll use this right now. It doesn't have the rules for the actions, but it does have um, the list of all of them. So you know, if you forget something, you can just refer to here and check it out. There's also, uh, shows you what you need to decide when you're setting up a tournament. Uh, if you're going to be doing like a game at the club or, or the gaming club or, or just like, you know, you and a buddy or maybe just by yourself at your house, you want to do like a one night tournament, all the things that you're going to need to take into account to set that up. And then uh, other gameplay information at the bottom down here, just kind of all the all the major things that you're most likely going to be referring to in the rule book. That's all here uh, and the page number that you need to refer to in the rule books, kind of just like, you know, just a, a quick way to, to go back to the page. So that's the quick reference sheet. That's what it's going to look like. It's going to be in the book as well as in a PDF document that's going to be free for download once the game launches. Uh, this is your night management sheet. This is the one that you're going to use to um, create your night if you don't want to, if you're building one in Excel or doing it on paper your own way, please obviously feel free, but this is the one that we're providing. Uh, this has, oh, sorry, hit the camera there. Um, <clears throat> so this is going to have, um, you know, your night's name, what your class is, how many experience points, what titles you have, how much gold and prestige is going to have your stat block in here. Uh, sections for all your skills and abilities depending on what you're going to be um, participating in, whether it's combat, jousting, archery, um, spot for your primary and mounted weapon that you're going to have in here, what armor you're using, your horse, your lance, and your bow. So you're going to have, this is going to be like um, your stat sheet as you go into a tournament. Obviously, you might accumulate more weapons different types of armor armor you might have a couple different horses like you might gain extra stuff as you play you so you might want to have a separate piece of paper or uh, something different that you can attach to your night sheet to kind of have all your options on here but this is the idea for this one is like this is the sheet that you would bring into when you're participating in a particular tournament that has all of your core stats as well as your equipment that you're going to be using for that tournament uh so next up uh, this is the last page that we have in here right now is uh, the nightly house management sheet. So this is like for like it's just to manage your house. So you're gonna have your player, the name of your house, like you know your Knights Templar, or you know you know make one up like the House of Bob, like whatever you want to call it. Um, you're gonna have spots in here for your house's coin, house's prestige, the month and year of your campaign going forward. Uh, there's spots here for your knight's name, how many tournaments they entered, how many um, how many combats they've won, how many jousting competitions they won, archery, how many tournaments they won, uh, how many experience points you have. There's also spots in here for you to log your castle upgrades, um, ransoms that you might owe people or might be owed to you. You're going to have a slot for ransoms in here as well. Um, also a place to log if you won any special events and who've won them, and then a spot for um, rivals and blood feuds. You have a section for that as well. And then down at the bottom, you have a separate section for notes. And that's kind of what the book looks like right now. Like I said, it's 95% um, set in stone here. Uh, so like what you see is most likely what you're going to get with some minor tweaks. So this has been Steel and Steed going, um, it's going to be coming out. Our goal is uh, middle of May. Um, we should have it printed and on shelves ready to go. We're going to be doing it. Like I said, as a soft cover book, we're also going to be uh, providing an option for you guys to purchase a PDF through godseyegames.com um, and maybe even War Games Vault. And like I said, once the game launches, uh, you're going to be able to buy a soft cover, PDF. We're also going to have uh, PDF card decks that you can download. We usually try to price them between um, five and six bucks, somewhere in that range, depending on how big the deck is. But we have it laid out so you can just print them out and through your printer for um, reference cards, not stuff that you need to play, just kind of just like um, stuff that can make life a little bit easier as far as um, ability cards, cards for weapons and special rules, things like that. So instead of you having to flip through the book, you just pull the card out. It's gonna be like a five five to seven dollar um, deck, depending on how big it is. And it most likely is gonna be about 100 to 120 cards, uh, I think at this point. So you'll be able to print those out. We're gonna have a color option printable for it, as well as a black and white for those of you that maybe wanna save ink and don't wanna print it in color. So you can do um, a professional looking card stock or a, just a basic one that you wanna take out with you. So you'll have options for that as well at launch. So this is Steel and Steed right now. Uh, keep an eye out for it. We'll be doing some more podcasts and stuff to kind of talk with some people and maybe explain some of these uh, specific things in further detail going forward. If you guys have any questions, you can hit us up at godseyegames.com and send an email. Um, you can hit me up at joe at godseyegames.com uh, if you have any specific questions or maybe you have a store and you want to stock it or anything, like if you want more information about the game, uh, just feel free to send me an email and ask me. I hope this is a... Uh 
Hope this is worth your while if you're interested in doing Knights of Tournament. Like I said, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it for those of you who are interested in, in the medieval combat um, and, and, you know, jousting and archery and all that kind of stuff. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys later.